Let's take a look at a faulty power supply and see if we can work out what's wrong with it. So I'm going to zoom down this. It is Ms. Mitsumi Elec Co Limited. That's either Electronic or Electric Co. Uh, and the message that came with it is, Hello Clive, I'm sending you the 12 volt switching regulator from my, from my Blu-ray player for a post-mortem analysis. The player had been left on standby for ages, but failed sometime between Christmas and my friend came over to watch a film. The 12 volt output appears to be zero volt and almost a dead short. No fuses or obvious explosion skid marks that I can see. These are all good things, actually. Uh, Keith Lambeau. So, it seems quite well made. I'm going to zoom out a bit here because I've already taken some pictures of the front and the back of the circuit board. We'll take a look, little look at this first and then we'll start testing it and uh, diagnose it. So, we have the incoming supply here, the mains here. And there is a fuse. There's a little sort of strange, it's, it, it's marked kind of almost like it's a zener, but it's a, a, a transient suppressor metal oxide varistor. There's a class uh, X2 suppression capacitor with discharge resistors across the back of it. A com mode suppression choke. The point of the com mode suppression choke is if current is flowing in through the circuit and out again, it poses low uh, sort of resistance to the path of current. If common mode noise is coming out, in the same direction, it has quite high impedance. It sort of pushes back against that. It's just uh, for it's a nice way of creating a, a very efficient interference suppressor. There's a couple of uh, capacitors going class Y capacitors going to the ground tab here, uh, and then it's going to the bridge rectifier. The bridge rectifier then charge rectifies and charges this capacitor 450 volt, 82 microfarad, which is quite a beefy one. And that then powers this rather unmemorably named chip, an FSGM300N, which is a very standard chip, uh, which is a switch mode power supply all in one package. It's got the driver transistor as well, which drives this uh, transformer. The output pretty much just has a diode here. A uh, big smooth capacitor, 25 volt, 3300 megafarad. The diode is completely un memorable the name it's an mbrf 10 100 ct it's dual short key diode three pins both the diodes pointing in towards the middle uh, and then the output is just a single voltage uh, two ground connections two m 12 volt and one d 12 volt they're both come together but one just goes via a link and one goes via an inductor the inductor is to the hold on the inductor is to the m connections for maybe motor perhaps Let's start probing about. The fact this dead short circuit is good because uh, that suggests, well, the first suspect most people would think of would be the capacitor and the output. It is not domed. It doesn't mean it's not the one at fault, but we really are getting across the back of this on the diode continuity test. Across that, we're getting a dead short. But my first suspect is actually the diode package here. One of the diodes in that package may have gone dead short. Uh, normally you'd expect to read a diode drop plus a, a, a sort of like a slight resistance of this winding, but I'm not getting that. So tell you what, let's remove this diode and test it and see if the fault goes with the diode being removed. Or at least uh, if the fault uh, is alleviated with the diode removed. I'm just looking for the solder. I'm not seeing the solder. There is solder here somewhere, but I've just not been very well organised. Right, I'll just grab some. I have some solder. So let's reflow. I'll zoom down this. There's a diode there with the sort of loads of uh, heat sinking in the vicinity, basically just a uh, bare tracks in the circuit board material to take a bit of solder and expose it to airflow movement. It seems quite generous because it's two 5 amp diodes. You'd think uh, it would take a lot to blow that, but to be honest, sometimes, if it is this, it's faulty. Sometimes uh, they just blow. So I'm going to try a couple of things here. I'm going to try heating all the pads alternately until it just randomly pops out, which might be possible. It is wiggling. It is want to come out, but it's not coming out. Ow, and now it's very, very hot. Hold on, I'll just make a complete mess of this. It is more or less, you know, it should be popping out right now. It is popping out right now. It's out. Now, 
Has one of those diodes failed? So I'm going to test from either side to the middle pin. That's what I'd call a normal diode. That is a dead short circuit. One of the diodes has failed in that. Now, does that mean that if I was to temporarily crap the duff diode off uh, and solder that back in, that incidentally will have stressed the capacitor because this is the output of this power supply. Let me just zoom out a bit. Uh, this is uh, the schematic of that chip power supply and that is minimalized, minimalist. It's, they've not shown all the components. But this is the output. That's this diode here. And if it's gone short circuit, that uh, winding will just have been, that capacitor will kind of seen a bit AC-ish, which isn't ideal. But also because the, uh, if it's shorted out, this uh, coupled winding here, the feedback winding that actually powers this chip will have seen there's basically a short circuit on the other side and it will have been doing that thing that it just pulses out. If you ever see the LED lights pulsing, uh, it will be doing that because uh, it's detecting effects of the short circuit and output and it's, uh, its own power supply needs that uh, uh, load to be normal on the other side. Right, tell you what, where is my desoldering braid? Yeah, I'm not organised at all. There's some random desoldering braid. I'll use that. Ooh, this is a new rule. I shall do what I normally do. I shall add a bit of flux to it. Because that does help so much with desoldering with the braid. Way too much flux. I completely forgot this is the uh, wide needle flux bottle. Not to worry. It doesn't really matter. There's no harm in having too much flux. As demonstrated by the Mega Pauls of Flux put on by Lewis Rossman and Co. Right, where am I here? This is where I'm wanting to soak up some soda here. Ah, uh, that hissing pop of flux. Can't remember which pad it is. I'll just do both of them. I just pressed unfeasibly hard with the soda iron there and felt the thread of the bit that screws in just go there. Excellent. That's called tool abuse. This is uh, not being helped much by the fact that this is on a heat sinking copper plane. But it's done. It's fine. Right. I'm going to stick this butcher diode back in. It's just going to be a single diode of the two, but they are just effectively in parallel. And I'm going to re solder that. Uh, if one of the diodes does fail, really just replace the whole diode. Let's see if this actually works a bit. I don't think it's damaged the primary side. I should have actually made sure that was standing up straight before. No, it's not. It's fine. I'll just squish it a little bit. Yeah, it's good enough. Okay, I'll just reflow these soda joints and then test again. And now when I put this across the... Uh, capacitor, you're probably going to get, uh, because it's not got a shunt across it, it's probably going to see the usual thing that happens when you probe across the capacitor, you're going to see the voltage sort of wavering up slowly like that. Uh, yep, that's a diode junction that is looking very good. And it's charged the capacitor. That is fine, right? Tell you what, I'm going to plug this into the mains and we'll see if the capacitor survived or not. One moment, please. The leads have been connected to it. Let's power it up. So this is my cliff quick test I'm just going to bring in here. I haven't a clue if this is going to do anything undesirable. I guess we'll find out when I power it up. It may make noises, it may just hiss, it may do nothing, or it may just put out 12 volts. The capacitors don't always die when this happens, but sometimes they do. Right, tell you what, I shall power it up and see what happens. Powering. This is good. Silence is good. We do like silence. The capacitor is not bulging up excitedly. So I'm going to nudge that circuit board, which is live, over to the side. I'm going to set this round to the 20 volt setting. I'm going to put the negative on the chassis connection here. And this one there, we have 12 volts. Uh, the unit is kind of, it's proven, is what I'll say. I wouldn't say it's repaired because I wouldn't leave it like that. So, um, in this instance, the full repair to this would be to change 
this capacitor and uh, this dual diode and that would pretty much give it a new lease of life. It's not uncommon for these diodes to fail. Now, do I give you a walk through of the circuitry? I could give, I keep going to reach that and I, I keep going down to, let's measure the voltage across that big capacitor. Because that is quite a big capacitor. That looks like it would really hurt if I touched it. Let's put this up to a thousand volts and stick it across that capacitor. It may have discharged. It's still at 270 volts. That would hurt like shit. That would be quite a spicy moment. Yeah, that's annoying. That's because the circuit's not got a load. Uh, and if it, you know, that is annoying that it's not got discharge resistors. That's uh, a memorable device. Right, maybe I won't explore that then, or maybe I'll discharge it. Uh, but the gist of it is, uh, I'll just put this over like this. I can show you in this. Let's uh, tame this down a little bit because it's quite ferocious. Maybe not that much. Maybe about there. Mm, yeah. So it's got the, the main supply comes in, goes through the bridge rectifier, capacitor there. It's interesting. This chip has the built in MOSFET for driving the coil. Uh, it has the startup resistor. The startup resistor charges this capacitor, which is used to actually power. I could zoom down this, couldn't I? Which is used to power the chip but only at the beginning. As soon as it powers up, this resistor is actually disconnected from that and it relies purely on the current coming from this uh, bootstrap coil coming through this diode and that resistor and charging this capacitor and that's how it's powered. That's how it can detect that that short circuit was happening on the other side. What would have been happening there is this resistor would have charged that up, it would have started up, but it wouldn't have got its power supply from here. So the capacitor would have uh, discharged that, uh, I'm just looking here, that's this capacitor here. Uh, and uh, then it would have started the cycle of charging up again. So it would be going dip, 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 just waiting for that fault to clear another side. Um, I could go into more detail. I could say that uh, this is a very minimalist approach. It's got all the extra interference suppression circuitry. I'm just, I'm just handling that board of caution at the side. Uh, which, uh, let me just uh, brighten this up. So the, it's got uh, extra components in the back, for instance. It's, this is the, the sensing on the secondary side to actually provide the feedback that the voltage is there is done by this little chip here with some support components that drives this opto isolator, which signals back to the chip. Uh, the chip itself, because it's switching an inductive load, it's not showing the drawing under here, but they're uh, up here between the drain and the positive rail is actually a diode here and then a uh, capacitor to cover the resistors across it. It's designed to take, it's like a little mini surge tank. It takes the spike off when that turns off, but it, without actually clamping the transformer itself, because uh, that's needed when that energy gets transferred across. Uh, that's more or less it. It's a very straightforward design. Looking up that chip, the uh, FSGM300N will give you all the information you need about that. It's basically just a very minimalist solution to that. But there we go. But before I, before I do go, I'm going to measure the voltage across that again, see if it's holding up, if it's still capable of delivering a zap. Has it tamed down yet? It has. Uh, that will have uh, just been the general power that circuitry has drained that away. That's good, but it's useful to know that this circuit board stays hot for a fair amount of time after you've unplugged it. Yeah, that is very useful to know.